This thought experiment came to me not after I read it in a book or some sort of philosophical article, but rather when I was playing split-screen gun game with my friend on Nuketown. No. Amidst our trash talking and clutches, he struck me with a question that left me very perplexed. It goes as follows. If you take a group of 20 highly competent immortal engineers and take them back to the Stone Age, give them all the necessary information and knowledge but none of the material and machinery required, how long would it take for them to build an iPhone? If a certain amount of time came to mind, I'll encourage you to tell me in the comments, because almost everyone I asked this question to came up with a different answer. For starters, I told my friend that I had to unpack that question a little bit before I could give him an estimate I thought was reasonable, and in the meantime I asked him how long he thought it would take. He paused for a few instants, and then he told me that in his estimate it would take about 3 years. To quote 46th American President Joe Biden, What? His answer genuinely caught me off guard because I was going to estimate an amount that was two orders of magnitude higher. I thought something closer to 150 years. I talked to him later and he changed his answer to like 20, maybe 50 years, but he said that it wouldn't take nearly as long as I thought it would. All I know is that that question lived rent-free in my head for much longer than I'd like to admit. Over the next few weeks or so, I asked various different peoples from different backgrounds and yeah, everyone came up with different estimates. Some higher, some lower and with various explanations for each. In this video, I will try and probably fail catastrophically to estimate how long it would take to actually build an iPhone from zero to the best of my ability. And I will also touch on a few other existential topics because why not? Also, don't mind the shitty gameplay, it's my first time playing Satisfactory. Where do we even begin? The iPhone, and as a matter of fact, almost every smartphone you can think of, is an inconceivably sophisticated piece of technology that most of us just take for granted. But think with me for a few moments. Do you know how the touchscreen works? What about the storage? Or the Face ID? I don't. I mean, I do because I did the research for this video, but still. Let's begin with something more simple than that. To even begin to work, any electronic or electric equipment will need electricity. You know the meme where the guy goes back in time and says he'll baffle everyone with his modern knowledge, and then when the ancient people ask him how do you make electricity, he doesn't know. I mean, it's kind of funny to shit on this guy, but we're probably on the same boat. To generate electricity, you need a flow of electrons, and that typically happens when you have more electrons on one side than on the other. This flow of electrons is called a current, and this difference of electrons between each side is called the voltage. The two main ways to get those going are by converting some sort of energy into electro energy, either chemical or kinetic. Chemical energy is how you get batteries, and don't get me wrong, we will need those for our smartphone, but once the chemical reaction stops, it's pretty much over unless we recharge it, and to do that, we're going to need another source of energy. That's why we are going to use kinetic for now. To convert kinetic energy into electrical energy, basically you need to get two big magnets, put them opposite to each other, and then you need to put some sort of spinny conductive material between those two. And, this is the hard part, try to make them spin. Simple as that, we have electricity. This is reasonably easy to achieve, at least compared to everything else we have to do. Copper is a relatively easy to find mineral, according to the games I play, and it's a very good conductor. Magnets, however, are kinda tough to find, I'm not gonna lie. I researched a bit and I found that lodestone is a naturally occurring magnet, and they can be found in chests in Bastion Remnant. Wait, lodestone can work, but apparently it's an extremely rare mineral. Magnetite, however, is a lot more common and can be found in mountains, mountain caves, gelatin caves, and the. Bro! Magnetite can be found in beaches, so they are relatively common. Basically, you just get a bunch of them, melt them together to get two big magnets, and you're golden, right? Wrong! Do you know how magnets work? It's one of the things that puzzled me the most when I was a child. Like, why is it that if you break them, they don't divide into a neat north and south chunk? Both chunks maintain a north and south side, it doesn't make sense. I had no idea about this, but apparently magnetism is a property of the arrangement of atoms. Essentially, they're all very neatly aligned in a way that they're like, pointing in the same direction, and that generates a magnetic field around it. That's why if you split it into two chunks, the atoms in each chunk are still aligned, so the magnetic field is still there. However, since temperature is essentially the movement of particles, as you heat things up, they change form. They don't even necessarily have to become liquid, they just rearrange into different ways as shown by this diagram, that I will not explain because this shit is way too complicated for the amount of money this video will make me. But you get what I mean, right? The magnetite will lose that special alignment after it hits a certain temperature. If you actually want to smelch a bunch of little magnetite chunks together to mold them into a more suitable shape, you just get a non-magnetic piece of iron instead. But even assuming they maintain their magnetism after smelting, you still need to figure out a way to do the smelting in the first place. 
It is not as simple as holding a piece of metal over the fire. Have you ever used a frying pan? You need to find fuel that burns at at least 1600 degrees Celsius. Wood burns at about 600 and coal can burn up to 1300, with different types reaching higher temperatures. While it won't melt completely, it will be soft enough that it can be hammered into shape. It's good that we tackle this now, because we will need some pretty good metallurgic skills if we want to do things properly. But yeah, melting shit together is not gonna work for the magnets. Let's just assume that you can like, glue a bunch of them together and put a coil in the middle of it and call it a day. Either get a guy to spin it around, or build it really big and put it in a river or some shit. I'd argue that that part, from like, extracting the raw material and assembling the generator, might take like, a week? A month if you also have to build a dam in the river with the big generator inside it. I don't know. Oh, and you also need the power lines to distribute all the energy around. Where were we? Oh, yeah. We are already 6 minutes into the video and I didn't even start building the iPhone yet, but at least we have electricity. Alright, the iPhone is essentially a computer. What is a computer? Well, it's essentially domesticated electricity. Every single process that occurs in any electronic device can be translated to a huge strings of ones and zeros that tells that machine what it's supposed to do. And the more I think about how all of this works, the more it hurts my head. Cause like, this video is playing at a resolution of 1080p. This means that there are 2,073,600 individual pixels in your screen that are somehow coordinating together and changing their individual RGB values at least 60 times a second to display the image you're seeing now. And as you may have guessed, this happens because each pixel is receiving a bunch of orders written in zeros and ones that tells them by how much each RGB value should be altered. And, like, that's just the screen, there's a lot more that goes into computing than just that. There's a good chance you'll know that the sequence of ones and zeros is called binary, and it is essentially a very efficient if slightly complicated way to count. The smallest unit of a binary system is a bit, and a bit is a boolean statement, basically a yes or no question, on or off, etc etc. If you see that a certain file has, say, 20 gigabytes, that means that it can be described using approximately 160 billion yes or no questions. All this to say that we need to find a way to make a very rudimentary machine that can communicate through zeros and ones. Before any coding languages or anything, just something that does that. How do we do it? We are going to need to create one of the fundamental building blocks of computing, the transistor. A transistor is essentially a thing that lets current pass if a certain condition is met. It basically acts like a gate that opens if there's electricity flowing here and stays closed otherwise. That's how we can simulate one bit. Open is 1 and close is 0. By arranging a bunch of transistors in different configurations, we get logic gates, which then allows us to make calculations and, you know, actual computing. To build a transistor, we are going to need a material called a semiconductor, aka something that lets current through sometimes but not always. Silicon is a pretty reliable semiconductor and it can be found quite abundantly on beaches. Let's see how many of those we need to make the... What the fu- The fun and nightmarish thing about this thought experiment is that it basically necessitates that you reinvent and refine almost every STEM field of knowledge we know. Beyond just having incredibly sophisticated and refined hardware, all this software that goes into the iPhone is also extremely complex. Transistors these days measure like 10 nanometers. For reference, the smallest viruses out there, which are smaller than our cells, are about 20 nanometers. To build something as tiny and sophisticated as that, you are going to need incredibly precise machines, which themselves require ludicrous amounts of knowledge to build. If you consider all the intricate hardware that you'll need to build, and all the software that goes into that hardware, you see yourself having to build dozens, maybe hundreds of different machines that can assemble every part of the iPhone correctly. Not only that, but you also basically need to reinvent computing and build the entire iOS from the ground up, using ones and zeros. And that's before even programming all the fancy shit like augmented reality and face ID. With the shitty Stone Age transistors we have right now, we can maybe put together a very rudimentary calculator that will marginally aid us in future processes. But things are not looking good for us. Admittedly, having all the technical knowledge will make building the softwares a lot easier, but they still need to assemble all the different sensors that go into making everything work. That's why I gave an initial estimate of 150 years. And the funny thing that I found out about this problem is that the further you estimate, the less it makes sense. Like, would it be absurd if I said that it would take instead 160 years? 10 years is a lot of time, but the answer to something quite as obtuse as this is so hard to find that something like 10 years will either be more than enough or not even close to enough. One time I heard of a different thought experiment that essentially demonstrated how hard it was to make something as simple as a pencil. 
like you need wood and to get that wood you'll need to cut down trees and to do that you need a saw and to get the saw you need iron and so on and so forth. This meme explains it better than I can but the central idea is that a lot of work and knowledge goes into making something and I find that just fascinating. Literally right now, look around you. Unless you live in a rural area or you're in like in a national park for whatever reason, you can see the product of this process everywhere. The walls in your room, the very device you're watching this video on was built on layers upon layers of complexity and assembled through the collective knowledge of thousands, maybe millions of people all throughout history. And it's interesting to see how much we take these little things for granted. Even the simplest, most innocuous thing you have in your sight right now probably had a long, detailed process behind it. Take for example this water bottle that is f***ed because I fell off my bike. Somebody extracted the metal, some other party refined it and turned it into steel or aluminum or whatever, and some other other party modeled the thing so that it could be assembled into this shape. This cursed moth bean thingy also had someone responsible for modeling it, someone who gathered the cotton and whatever other materials go into it, and someone who sewed it together. Even something like a toothpick involves someone extracting the wood with heavy machinery, transporting it into some sort of facility that cuts and refines the wood into these little picks, and then they're put into containers to be sold at retail. Everything that you can see has a ridiculous amount of complexity, except for maybe trees, and even so. It really puts into question just how far one could get if they were actually transported to the past. Maybe you'd be able to get electricity, and maybe even antibiotics, but if you ask me how to create something like soap, I wouldn't know. What about building a house? Fuck, even something like a campfire would give me trouble. And to think that right now we are living with luxuries that kings 500 years ago wouldn't have conceived of in their wildest dreams is a testament to just how much and how well humans do when they rely on each other. The progress of a civilization is dictated by the speed and ease with which information can be disseminated. I don't actually know if this is true, I made it up, but think about it. First came language, allowing for the hunter-gatherers to cooperate in a more effective manner. Something like that is essential if you want to hunt something big or know how to return home. This was the first major breakthrough that allowed people to accurately exchange information throughout short distances. Later came writing, allowing people to accurately record and keep accurate track of information throughout not only short distances, but also time. Keeping track of data would be very difficult if the only resource available to us was speech. Stuff like chosen words, intonation and even memories are bound to change or distort the data that we are trying to convey. But if you have something that can permanently register all the things that are being said, that information is going to quite literally be written in stone. Or paper, if you're more into that. Stuff like time and memory will take a long ass time to alter what is physically registered through erosion and semantic shift respectively, but the message will remain exactly the same as it was the first time it was written. Later still came the printing press, which was a revolution in production terms. Now you have a fast and reliable way to copy large amounts of information and distribute it around, whereas before you needed to have people physically copying the books and other things like that by reading each page and manually writing it down. A little later still came telecommunication. Radio, television, the internet, that sort of thing. Out of these, the internet was probably the biggest jump in terms of how fast information can spread. Now, instead of sending a pigeon or some kid running with a newspaper, information can be shared so fast that it's practically instantaneous. I can see something happening on the other side of the globe with less than 5 seconds of latency. That is practically magic. I am pressed to believe that the speed and ease with which information can be disseminated is directly correlated with the nigh exponential rate at which technology develops. But it's not like having the internet will just magically solve all your problems, on the contrary, it caused most of mine. It's not just about how fast information can spread, as another very important factor are how many people can work to put that information to practice. This video was about the iPhone originally, right? Say we get our original group of engineers, but instead of 20, let's make them a thousand. Now I'd reckon that it will take significantly less time as the workload is spread across more hands, but I still think it will take a minimum of 30 years working non-stop. As you may have guessed, I don't think that increasing the amount of engineers will linearly decrease the amount of time it takes to build the iPhone. You probably get to a point where there will be diminishing returns, but the real question to ask is the following. Would a group of a thousand engineers of various different fields with no knowledge on how to create the iPhone be able to build one faster than our team of 20? The 20 would have all the blueprints and data sheets, but the 1000 would only know what an iPhone is and what it does, but not exactly what goes into it. Feel free to leave your estimates in the comments, I am by no means using this as a ploy to boost my engagement. Honestly, I think it would take longer for the group of thousands because they're actually having to reinvent everything. Technically, the story of humankind is more similar to them than to the group of 20. But hey, the bottom line is that you shouldn't be listening to me for an answer to this. The title of the video is not a rhetorical question and I'm literally just an e-boy. What the f*** did you expect?